round of yeah. introductions. Uh, across over there is Anand Dharmaraj. Uh, first, let me tell you, we are all avid motorcyclists. That's what joins us together. That's why we are here. Uh, so I'm not going to talk about the motorcycle part of it, apart from where it's necessary. Anand uh, runs this wonderful thing called Indy Motard. He's the founder of that. Brings years of racing, rallying, and uh, touring experience to this platform. Right next to him is Niels Peter Jensen. He is known for an initiative called Helmets for India, which is Royal Enfield's aim to bring together the, the twin worlds of art and motorcycles to promote road safety. Uh, Niels is the person who conceptualized and founded that. He's also one of the world's most renowned mountain bikers. Long time ago. <laughs> it's never too long. Uh, Ritika is a women's motorcycle coach, teaches uh, motorcycle riding to a whole bunch of people, including people whose livelihoods might depend on motorcycles. Uh, she's also a stunt artist, has featured in numerous TVCs, print ads, etc. Benno uh, is also a very, very accomplished motorcyclist. He's uh, not traveled in the Himalayas yet, but he's traveled in the Middle East and a whole lot of other parts of the world. He's actually UNESCO's natural sciences specialist. Am I right, Benno? Yeah. And next to me is uh, possibly the best dressed biker you'll ever see. Uh, that is Huda Masood. Huda, uh, Huda, yes, the boots and the saris, it's fantastic. So Huda is uh, the founder of something called Huda Bar. It's an organic energy bar which is packaged very responsibly and sustainably. And Huda does have a motorcycle story which leads up to it, which I will goad her to tell you about, and you will have to be patient enough to listen. And with that, I would like to throw open the panel. Uh, Sewang has already introduced me, so I'm not going to go into much details about myself. So with that, I'd like to throw open the panel. But before I do that, I just want people to understand why motorcycles and intangible cultural heritage are coming together. Uh, I think it's important to establish that connect. Whether you are looking at Colonel T. E. Lawrence, better known as Lawrence of Arabia, on his rough superiors, or whether you're looking at Che Guevara writing his world with his uh, motorcycle diaries, essentially motorcycles and tourism has always explored and told stories. We understand culture, we understand heritage, and we understand that the two of them together are intangible. It's not a concept that everybody gets. We do understand that, which means, although it may not seem so at first, the partnership between UNESCO, Royal Enfield, on intangible cultural heritage is actually a natural partnership. Mm -hmm. Would you agree, Benno? It's a natural partnership. There you go. Uh, we also understand that sometimes, in our bid to tell stories, we gain a bit of a reputation. And it's not always a positive reputation. We go into spaces where we think we are doing the right thing, but we are essentially invading other people's spaces as well. So there is a need to understand that to tell the story, we need to be responsible. We need to also understand that to tell a story, we also need to come back enriched. If we are not enriched by our experiences, what stories are we going to tell? So that is more or less the gamut of what we'll try and cover. And I will start with the most obvious, the lure of the Himalayas. I mean. We are all from different parts of the country, the world, but we are all looking to the Himalayas. That's where we want to travel the most on our two wheels. And uh, I will start with Anand, move on to Niels and Ritika, why Benno is looking forward to it, but who does experience. And maybe if there's time, I'll tell you a little bit about mine. So with that, Anand, the lure of the Himalayas. So yeah, um, thank you all for coming. Um, when I started out, um, I think when I moved back to India from the US, I realized that I had not, I'd not seen my own country. So it took somebody else to sort of prompt me to say, you know, have you seen um, what India is about? And I realized that I had missed out so much that uh, I spent quite a bit of time in the Himalayas and I've been going back for the last maybe 20 years. And I see how it has changed. And I also have, I'm going to say, I'd like to say I'm a pessimist on one hand, but I'm also an optimist that believes that things will change based on how we behave and how responsible we are as people, uh, especially as motorcyclists, because as he mentioned, um, 
I can take a motorcycle and go into places that a car can never get to, right? It has its advantages, but it also means that I'm treading on uh, quite delicate, uh, not just the flora and fauna, but also uh, the culture that you're sort of, in one sense, invading. Uh, and I know that it has only, um, I want to say this in a good way, is that um, you can't stop people from doing this. People have gone and explored the world and found and discovered many things. Uh, it has its positives, but it's also how do I create awareness? I take people on tours uh, in South Africa, in Europe, in Cambodia, in Sri Lanka, and I do try and sort of um, run the brief with each of them to say, um, what we are doing is we are the guests in that, let's leave as, as little a footprint as possible when we travel. And I think that's the message that I'd like to start with, uh, open to discuss more, of course, that we're here. Um, and it's close to my heart. Uh, we, are, we all love to, we're all here because of some wanderlust. And I think uh, it's, it's our responsibility to not just educate ourselves, but also how we behave with, uh, with respect to the community, where we are. And uh, I hope this uh, really takes that movement forward. And I see a lot of parallels in um, riders taking responsibility for wearing gear, being safe, learning, going to schools, uh, being better as a, as, a, as a person. And I think that's kind of where I would like to start. Thank you, Anand. How about you, Niels? Uh, well, first of all, thanks for giving me the chance to be here. Um, before I speak about Helmets for India and trying to make a change, trying to make the, the roads, let's call it safer in India, and trying to make wearing helmets cool, um, uh, yeah, I started being a professional mountain biker when I was 19. And when you're 19, I was like a, a little punk and all I cared about was like riding down the hill as fast as possible. So I didn't really care about the roots of the trees. When I saw a root, I'm like, oh, if I, put, if I get my shovel and put a jump there, I can jump over this rock. And if I cut down this tree, I can jump over that. So it was, I used the mountains as my playground. I live at the beach. I love the mountains, so I'm forced to live at the beach. I would rather live in the mountains. But anyway, so back then, mountain biking, it has nothing to do with, but it's, it's a good bridge that you gave me. So in the beginning, I loved nature, but I loved it the way it gave me a reason to have fun. And, uh, but I learned very quick to understand if I keep acting like this little punk who just wants to have fun in the mountains, that one day, because it came at period of time where people say, hey, listen, all you mountain bikers, you're, you're idiots. You destroy the mountains. You just put banners everywhere. You make World Cups. You make this. You make that. So all of a sudden, mountain biking was not cool. People didn't like it. And I was one part of it. So I learned very quick to respect my playground, the mountains. So when I started riding motorcycles, um, all of a sudden, I found myself in the same position. Uh, motorcycle riding had a bad representation. Um, in Italy, it was forbidden to ride motorcycles because people go crazy every weekend, loud motorcycles. And more and more, I understand, like, if we keep doing this, you know, we're just going to ride the roads. And that's, it's fun, but it's also very fun to explore places on the planet where cars don't take you. And um, if I think back in my life, two wheels are the reasons why I'm sitting here and having the chance to sit with all you guys. So at the end of the day, two wheels created my life and, and it also made me um, realize how big this world is. Before, uh, I was just like, you know, jumping on the plane, being here, being there, and I just saw the normal stuff. All of a sudden, I see stuff I've never seen before. But I also see stuff that really sorry for the language, that pisses me off, um, is like that people don't care about themselves. Um, 2018, so me wearing a helmet is the most normal thing in life. Because every time I put a helmet on, I know I go on a mission, I go on an adventure, I have a good time. So 2018, um, I came to India uh, for a TV show, and in the beginning I said, uh, India, I don't know, now maybe let's go to some other country. Don't ask me why. But I landed in 2018 in Mumbai, and I'm like, oh my god, this is crazy. 24 hours later, um, 
And I'm not saying that so you like me. Uh, some people who really know me, they know how much I love this country. Uh, I realize India is the most beautiful country in the world. Um, not saying that to like me, I don't really care, but um, I think you guys know how amazing this country is. And uh, I've seen other countries, all countries basically, and have a chance to live in other countries like Japan, and it's, it's amazing, but this place is unique. So I saw an accident on a motorcycle, young kid, the father was wearing a helmet, the kid wasn't wearing a helmet. In the beginning I didn't really see that nobody really wears a helmet, because it was so much hectic. And then I saw this accident, and the kid, I didn't know exactly how, what happened to the kid, but I know the kid would have stand up if the kid would have worn a helmet. But for me as a father of four kids, I could not understand why the kid was not wearing a helmet. So this is how I created Helmets for India, but I didn't want to come to this country that I love so much and say, and point my fingers on you and say, hey, you need to wear a helmet, otherwise you might die. It's, it's, it's the wrong way. I don't tell my kids, don't eat candies, because the next time I turn around my back, they would eat all the candies. So I said, eat candies if you want, you have to make your own experience. But in this case, you only have one life, and if you take the chance to crash and you have no helmet, it's, you can really learn out of it if it's a bad crash. So I had the responsibility, I don't know why, but I said, like, I need to make a change in India, and I was very naive coming here and say, okay, I will make a change. So I involved all the artists. And I mean, there's a website, helmetsforunia.com, so it explains the whole story. But so I was fighting for it for one year, and I think we made some changes, but I knew I would not make it alone. So my biggest dream was to, to partner up with the biggest brand on this planet and the most unique and most heritage brand, and that was Roy Enfield. And two years ago, I said that we had a conversation this morning on the panel. Um, they never asked about numbers, how's the marketing concept, how's this, how's that. They, they listened to me, we had a meeting in uh, London. I think three months later I flew over here. We decided a partnership and now I'm able to make a change, I think, in India with Roy Enfield and that's why I'm sitting here and uh, yeah, having the chance to tell you my story and hoping that you guys will tell your friends, your family members, and the people you see on the street, hey, I care for you, please wear helmets. So that's my mission, and yeah, hopefully one day we make a change. Thanks, Niels. In fact, uh, I don't know if all of you have had a chance to look outside towards the back. There's a motorcycle parked and some helmets. Those are all part of Helmets for India. They are basically art helmets, if you like. It makes helmets look very, very cool. You don't stand out as run-of-the-mill, so that's a good thing. Moving on to Ritika, uh, have you ridden to the Himalayas? And if you have, why would you go there again? Thank you guys for having me here. So, I am, of course, a motorcyclist, and uh, as you said, yes, I do have chances to go and travel all over India. But uh, yes, few years back, 2019, uh, when I quit my job, I realized that people in India, as Niels also said very correctly, helmet is no, if it looks cool on you, you would definitely want to wear it. However, in India, people only wear it to just get safe from the cops. And that's how they look across it. And that's a fact everybody knows about it. But uh, yes, so I decided to become a woman motorcycle coach since then. And the easiest thing I could do towards this was to teach women, not only women, I would say definitely men as well, but uh, yes, helping them to understand the basic motorcycling and understanding the reason why do we have gears and the safety gears. So I have a lot of clients, those who just want to not wear helmet during their riding because they want to take a video so they look cool on it. Guys, it doesn't look cool at all. You just sending across the wrong messages. And I've seen this on Instagram as well. We are so well connected on social media nowadays. I have a lot of you know, motorcyclists going ahead, you know, getting out videos without helmets and all, and just posting it. I don't understand. Riding is about enjoying the entire feeling, but what is the use if you don't wear your safety gears correctly? If you don't wear your helmets, that's not really going to look cool on you. 
Apart from that, uh, yes, as you said to Himalayas, yes. A uh, few things I have realized. Uh, people, like basically riders love trails, like random trails. So if you see any trail out there, they just want to go explore it with their bike. But what about the basic vegetation that you're destroying? Because one thing that you do is you go across to the trail, you just go ahead, record a video, just post it on your Instagram, there will be somebody after you going ahead as well. So that's basically a complete destroy it that you, you would have done it 1%, but what about the people coming after you? They're going to destroy it much more. Even if you love going ahead on mountains and riding it, you're getting out the entire sand and everything down. You won't be able to put it back. So why destroy it? At the first place, would you not destroy your own house? Same way, it is housed to many people and a lot of community. So I would always say, like, whenever you all ride, responsibility is what goes across with you hand in hand. So if you do not pass on a correct message with wearing helmets or correct gears, I understand gears are very expensive, but I think not more expensive than your life. So we go ahead and buy good helmets. Once when you start wearing helmets and if you, the best thing you could do is personalize your helmets. It's make it a part of your day-to-day -day life. Because also I understand like for a lot of people, uh, riding like us is a leisure, but for a lot of people it's a livelihood. Like for basic people, those who, you know, go ahead with Sumato and Swiggy, for them it's livelihood. They don't like to ride it because they love it. They are doing it because they have to. There's no other choice. So yeah, please wear good helmets. I understand it's very expensive. Like me and Niels had to talk about it. Like a good helmet would cost anywhere between five to 10 grands, definitely. But also there could be some DIY that we could figure out or we were discussing about it, we tried to figure out and make it more sustainable for everyone so anybody can utilize it and use it as well. Thank you. Thanks, Ritika. So very, very clearly message of safety going out there from two people on the panel. Uh, I was actually hoping to bring in safety a little bit later, but it's right up there. Uh, having said that, uh, Benno, what do you have to say about this particular aspect of uh, riding? You've ridden a lot in a lot of countries. What has been your experience? And let's see if we can touch upon the diversity of experience in different countries. So first of all, thank you very, very much to Royal Enfield to invite UNESCO to be part of this. I'm very excited about this. And uh, I couldn't agree more with the uh, with you that uh, basically I think we all agree that who does not wear a helmet is basically an idiot. <laughs> basically an idiot. And uh, if you hear me online and, and uh, please, if you drive without a helmet, we all look at you like real bikers think that you're an idiot. <laughs> so that's, uh, I think that's a very, very clear message. Sorry to start so aggressively, but uh, I'm, um, I'm relatively new in India. I've not traveled the Himalayas. I'm looking forward to do that, maybe together with some people on the panel here. I traveled the uh, Alps and other mountains in Europe, and in, also in Northern Europe, Scandinavia extensively. I traveled the Hajar Mountains in um, Oman and United Arab Emirates, and the last trip in mountain areas was between Thailand and Myanmar. So I'm a passionate rider like all of us here, and uh, I also want to share a few Points. First of all, I hope that what we are starting here will be a long-term relationship uh, and not only in the Himalayas, as you pointed out, India is such a beautiful country, you pointed it out as well. There are 12 UNESCO biosphere reserves where we could also in the future go and experience the intangible cultural heritage over there, all over India. Um, yeah. Most motorcyclists are naturally careful people. And uh, in this partnership, we want to bring them up to a new level of respect. And I want to cite a friend of mine, which is the Qatari World Rally Champion, Nasser al Atia. We discussed road, worthy, sorry, uh, road safety issues many years ago. And uh, Nasser, he said that driving is all about attitude. So motorcyclists, we say riding, but riding is all about attitude and uh, normally motorcyclists are very respectful people and are very careful people and that's also the reason why statistically they cause significantly less accidents 
in comparison, for example, with car drivers. So we have to respect nature when we are going out there. That includes air pollution. That includes noise pollution. We don't want to ride uh, without silencers. We want to have good silencers on the bikes and not riff all the time like crazies. We want to be responsible people. We want to promote the low fuel consumption. And we don't want to go off-road, except for, you mentioned that, in places which are dedicated for that. Because otherwise we are having an adverse impact on the soil, on the thin veneer of vegetation and, and, and grassland, especially in the, in the uh, mountainous areas. We want also to respect the culture of the people that we visit and uh, be ultra sensitive when visiting communities. And we have to ask them questions. And we have, if we want to take photos, which we of course want to, because we don't want to take animal trophies or plant trophies or uh, other um, uh, stone trophies or so, we want to ask the people if they agree if we take photos with them. But of course, with the, with, with the riders that we will uh, ride out there, we will have training and discuss this a little bit more. Again, I want to come back to the safety. That is basically, it translates into respecting ourselves. So please respect yourself. Make sure um, you plan the road trip properly. Make sure that you inform somebody where you are. Make sure your brakes work, your tires are fine, you take enough fuel with you. You wear a helmet. In my opinion, as a biker, there's another item which is even more important than the, than the crash helmet, which are the gloves. So uh, the gloves are easily as important or more important than the, than the helmet. And as the lady next to me, you also need to wear proper boots. <laughs> so yeah. And finally, psychological safety. We need to avoid overconfidence. Because if you are sitting on one of these powerful machines, you feel like we are somebody, yeah, yeah. right? That's why we're right. So, uh, yes, but that also, <laughs> exactly, but that's also <laughs> why we have to control the dimension between the eyes and the ears and the brain, and in particular our right hand, <laughs> which accelerates the bike. So, yeah, check the weather forecast. Are there heavy rains? What is the season? Is it very hot? And if it's very hot, it gets very, very hot under the crash helmet. So you need to adjust the helmet accordingly. So kind of, I can also understand the Zomato riders a little bit. I feel for them because wearing the helmet in the, in the heat, maybe we need to produce a number of new helmets with, with better ventilation. And select your, select your gear accordingly. So above all, also count on mistakes of others and erratic driving of others. This is something you need to keep in mind. We need to keep in mind permanently. One small mistake, not so much of ourselves, but of other traffic participants, can be deadly. Thank you. Thank you very much, Benno. Uh, for Huda, I want to shift the focus a little bit. Uh, whatever I've read up about her, there's a lot of sustainability and responsibility and that sort of message which goes on through Huda's uh, own life. Uh, I, I believe she's a person who leads less by opinion and more by example. So I wanted to ask, uh, what is it about sustainability that connects the worlds of bikers with terrain, communities, people, stories, etc.? It's nice to see everyone over here, but I'm suddenly so nervous. <laughs> um, I like that, you know, you've completely, everybody else got one question and I just got the other one. While I was preparing for everything <laughs> that all of these guys were saying, you know, you just like changed the question paper on me. And on I, I, I gave you the maximum <laughs> amount of time. I mean, one, two, three, yeah, four. Yeah, and then you You're changed the, the question on me <laughs> completely. Okay, so um, let me start off by uh, telling you what my journey has been with regards to motorcycling and how sustainability fed into it. I started riding very late in life. I started at 30. I'm 40 now. I've been riding for 10 years. Anand was my first, look at him, you're not in trouble, <laughs> was my first teacher, so to speak. Um, I belong to an organization. Uh, it's called Motorcycle Travelers Meet. 
and we started meeting in 2013 and we've been trying to promote responsible, sensitive travel since then. My brush with sustainability was when I started traveling and remote places were filled with bottles and chips packets and styrofoam boxes and booze bottles and these were places of unimaginable beauty. You just had to stand and see the horizon and you saw, you saw what made you feel small and big at the same time. And then you looked down and you were wading ankle deep in trash. And one of the things that I wanted to do was, one, not stop for food. I never wanted to stop once I got on that motorcycle. It's, um, yeah, you feel like something else, like Benno said. Um, and the other thing was I never wanted to leave pieces of me behind. I've made mistakes. I mean, I've bought the water bottles. I've bought the chips packets. I've, even if I responsibly dispose trash in a waste basket, it's still an imprint that I've left over there. And so I started a company and uh, while it was difficult and it still continues to be difficult and challenging, one of the things that um, I do is uh, manufacture energy bars that have ingredients that are grown in India for the most part. And they're packaged in um, metal and paper and there's no single use plastic. I've been very privileged. Royal Enfield has taken the bars to the Himalayas. Um, Anand has taken them to Baja, Mexico. I took to Germany. He took them to Germany and he, he found one a month ago and he still ate it. Um, he's alive, as you can on see. Starving. Yeah. So for me, sustainability starts with one thought and one thought alone. Everything that you consume on your travels, everything, whether it's toothpaste, water, snacks, whatever kind of food, whatever kind of cosmetic, imagine if you had to take back everything that you tore open and consumed out of. Keep that thought in mind whenever you travel, whether you travel on a motorcycle or in a car or in a bus with people. Imagine if you had no choice but to take back everything that you consumed. I think when you keep that thought in mind, what it allows you to do is at least look for alternatives. At least know that you're not filling up your bag with trash because that's what you're doing to sensitive places that you go to, especially the mountains. The mountains don't have the luxury of biodegradability as much as the plains do, as much as the jungles do. There's just not that much activity. And what you leave behind lasts for a much longer time up there. So for everyone, and I know everyone travels over here, I know everyone's over here because they either want to be on two wheels or they're already on two wheels, or they're hoping, like how we're all hoping to go and ride soon in September. And what that allows you to do is one, it, you don't leave a trace of yours, and it also lets you see how other people live and how other people cope and how they've been living and keeping their ghar saf, how they're keeping their homes and the sanctity of their homes intact. So yes, that's, that's my little lecture on sustainability since you changed the question on me. Not, not bad at all for someone who got a googly question. Uh, two very important points I picked up from both Huda as well as Benno, and as a motorcyclist myself, is um, one is linked to fuel, the other one is linked to consumption. I think as a motorcyclist, one of the things we consume the most in most prolific quantities is the fuel in our tank. We never really talk about it. We always talk about the trash that we throw, the stuff that we consume, etc. But we are constantly consuming fuel. And the exhaust gases that come out of the exhaust pipes is leaving a footprint which we simply cannot avoid. 
if we have to travel, we will consume. One of the things that I've always talked about with my fellow journalists, with people I have talked to, friends, is how do you travel where you consume less fuel? Develop practices where it allows you to ride in a manner that you're not constantly consuming fuel by the gallon. I see a lot of riders, and I, I'm a journalist, so I love putting things in neat little boxes. So I have three very different kinds of boxes for motorcyclists. One is the commuter. The poor fellow does not have the means to go from two to four wheels and is dependent on the motorcycle for livelihood, like Ritika mentioned. Then there's the very serious motorcyclists, people like Benno, Anand, Niels, and the rest of us here, who believe in being responsible because we want to protect our reputation of being responsible good bikers. And then there's the casual tourist who sits in the middle, who will go up into the mountains, pay a down payment, hire a two-wheeler, and then just blast through. They have their throttles open wide. I mean, we, we love to say that, you know, when in doubt, flat out, but flat out is probably not the best option in the mountains where you're riding through a fragile ecosystem. I mean, you want to go flat out, be like Anand, go to a racetrack, get your knees scraped, elbows scraped, and win some titles and come back, but mountains is not the place where you do it. You go there because you want to ride through beautiful landscape where you can come back again. My first experience of uh, traveling through the Himalayas, and I love the Himalayas, I call it my spiritual home as much as Royal Enfield does, even though my association with the Himalayas is a lot shorter. Uh, I'm not as old as the brand. Uh, <laughs> the, oh, I have to pass on the message that I'm a young man. Uh, but uh, fact of the matter is, the first time I did go to Ladakh, there was not a single road through Moray Plains. It was 40 kilometers end to end, and by the time you had gone one third deep, you felt disoriented because there was no reference point. The next time I went there, there was a road which we didn't want to use because in India we built very smooth roads, so we preferred to stay off the road, which was somewhat smoother, and uh, use the road as a reference point. Now I believe you can go from Manali to Sarchu in about five hours. Five hours is what it used to take for people to ride from Manali to Tandi which is where you fueled up because if you didn't, well, you'd be stranded in the middle of the highway until some other biker would come and give you some. By the way, we bikers always help each other out. We are, we are the nicest people you'll ever meet. Uh, uh, so, Anand, I wanted to ask you about this whole culture of going, trying to go as fast as possible on a tour. I, as a motorcyclist, as a tourist, I don't understand that because when I'm touring, I'm essentially not just, of course I'm riding and the ride is beautiful, but I also want to see, I also want to collect for my mind and to bring back memories. And I won't experience that if I'm riding too fast, right? So I wanted to uh, understand how you as an ex-racer, rallyist, and now an organizer of tours, how do you, how do you balance these two? So it's, um, <clears throat> I think it's a little bit of a, I mean, I have, a, in my mind, there's like two parts to this one, which is sustainability. It relates highly to sustainability. And the second part of it is also, if I call it um, education, awareness as a, as a rider, right? So on a tour, for example, I have briefings that I'm very clear about. There's a lead, there's a sweep, and each point in time, I'm very clear about when we go through villages, for example, is to back off the throttle. When you uh, stop, line up in one place. If you're in any, any sort of, anywhere that for that matter, rather than being um, the sore thumb that sticks out that's saying, I've had people on a tour in the middle of Baralachla saying, can I get dahi here? It's like, boss, come on. It's not possible, right? So. People have to drop, I think, I always tell them, keep an open mind. You're in a different part of the world, you're in a different part of uh, culture that you need to sort of accept. Yeah, not, not, not all of it is digestible to us as people as we travel. We want our comforts, especially for somebody who's come from a city. I think we're all spoiled brats. I mean, how do you sort of get past that point to say, I have to keep an open mind and I'm here as a guest with these people and they're there to earn a living. I mean, the tent in any of these places, if you go stop for a bread omelette, a paratha, whatever it is, they're just there for that season making that money because they can go back home and come back for the next season. 
So I try and sort of, if I want to keep it, I control what I do with the tours, with the people. And I think I have noticed that if I give them, um, I'm going to say enough time, or the fact that there is a lot more to enjoy than just ripping through places, they start to appreciate what's around us. And I think that's a difficult sort of conversion. And uh, the second part, I just wanted to sort of talk about uh, safety, as I think it's mentioned before, but also to create people to say, is there, a, is there a place that people can go and understand how to be better in terms of not just being safe for yourself, but also for safety of the people that you're traveling through. I mean, any part of the world that you go to, you have to be sensitive to where you are and how you sort of accept uh, those laws or, uh, you know, the footprint that you're putting. And I think this is part of what I run in the tour to make sure that if you want to get your kicks, go to a racetrack, go somewhere that it's enclosed. Like what uh, Benno said is uh, go to dedicated places where you can really get your kicks rather than trying to kill somebody or kill yourself. And I think it's okay if you die. I'd rather not live as, as a vegetable. You know, you're just making other people, uh, you know, look after you for the rest of your life. So I'd rather sort of just say, go to a school, learn how to write better. But coming back to your point, I think it's important. I don't know how this is, I don't have a solution for it. But how do you sort of get riders to understand that? I understand the thrill of saying, oh, you know, I'm going to go to Ladakh, Kanyakumari to Kardungla, K to K. And they just want to make it in the quickest, shortest possible time. And you can't stop them, right? It's a free world. But can I make them more aware of what the basic sort of etiquette of riding is? I think that's kind of where I would like to start. Um, I'd like to jump in over here. Anand, um, I think that you also... Anand runs a school and he teaches people how to ride motorcycles. And it's not just on track. He does do it on terrain that isn't tarmac. One of the things that um, Anand and his colleagues have taught us is to, like you said, for fuel consumption, is to be able to ride better. And when you ride better and you have better reflexes and you're calmer, you are not an idiot on the bike. You're not revving, you're not panicking, you're not, you know, doing dangerous things. You're not doing things that are wasteful and that are as damaging. Let's face it, all of us, accept responsibility for the fact that, you know, we are leaving a footprint, we are consuming, we are disturbing terrain. We accept that responsibility, but in also ex accepting that responsibility, what we are trying to do is offset the kind of damage that we're doing. And I completely disagree with Benno. I don't think most motorcyclists are respectful people. I think that, you know, in, I absolutely do not, at least not in the Indian context. I think that there are more accidents that are caused by motorcyclists in India specifically. I think that they are, um, in the context of Zomato, Swiggy, the entire commuter uh, motorcycling culture or two-wheeler culture, we have gotten to the point where saying that delivery in 10 minutes is a, is is a good thing, it's not a bad thing. And uh, we are all horrified that these kinds of claims are coming out that will deliver in 10 minutes. It has contributed to a culture of danger, it has contributed to a culture of carelessness, it has contributed to a culture of damage. So yeah, my advice is find somebody to teach you, find somebody to teach you to be calm, find somebody to teach you to be responsible, and find somebody to teach you the basics who constantly upgrades their knowledge and you not only will be a safer rider, but you'll also be somebody who consumes less and is more careful of the damage that you cause. Thanks, Huda and Anand. Uh, since we were talking about pace, I'm going to bring it now to <coughs> Niels, obviously, since he started off saying that, you know, it was absolutely just pace that used to get his adrenaline flowing. So you've obviously slowed down a bit since yeah. Yes, please. Sorry, please go ahead. <laughs> so yeah, you were talking about fuel consumption. So solutions that as riders, what we could come across when you travel towards the mountains. Uh, understand when you ride to, uh, through the entire India, you have a lot of responsibility, you have a lot of baggage to carry on. But once you reach to the location, like if you want to go to Ladakh, and there's a group of 10 bikers, and everybody's riding solo, leave five bikes go on the remaining five, it's not that difficult as long as you want to see the place and explore it. Like I'm not saying it's too much, 
Like, come on, you can try doing it because you just. Sorry. No. No one wants to stop your bike. That's exactly what we were trying to do. It being a responsible leader and wait, trying wait, our best. It's, a, it's an interesting thought, and I think it's going to split this room down, <laughs> straight down the middle, <laughs> as to whether it's good to ride solo or whether. I mean. No. Once when you reach the location, like you've I'm reached Ladakh. Sitting, I'm not sitting down. So see, that's exactly where we need to change our thought process. Yeah. Sorry, I have to ask. Would you like to sit doubles with somebody, Beno? As long as they're sitting behind me. Let me answer. So my, my beloved wife and me, we bike together, and she does not have a driving license. So I'm, it's very easy for me to answer that question. But so that's, there you have my answer. No, I said if you would like to sit behind. Maybe I would like to sit behind somebody who I would trust a lot. Yeah, okay. But if I have um, somebody fill in any swear word you want now, and then uh, riding the bike and I'm sitting behind that person. <laughs> no way, Jose. Thank you very much. No, but, but that's a very interesting thought because um, I'm somewhat of a fence sitter on this one because uh, I agree with Benno that I might sit billion with someone I absolutely trust who probably won't kill me or maim me with a crash. I've been through that experience, it's very painful. I didn't die or wasn't maimed, thankfully, but uh, it's very, very painful when somebody crashes and you have absolutely no control because you have no idea what that person's gonna do next. He jumped off the bike, I was sitting behind, I couldn't, so. Uh, and I'm Yeah, not but would you not, if you've been traveling with a group, like no, from so, a long distance, then would so, you definitely so give it a try? So let's say if, if I was traveling with any of my colleagues who I really trust, mm -hmm. uh, I probably would agree to sit pillion provided we had an agreement that it would <laughs> always be halves and halves. So if it's a 10 kilometer <laughs> yeah, yeah, route, absolutely. we change midway and I get to ride the remaining five. Otherwise, it's a no-go. It's, it's, yeah, it's, that's, it's not that's exactly what I'm saying. So you can definitely try finding there is, solutions there is, there, to there it. There are ways and means. Absolutely. Uh, however, I also agree with Anand that this is a very difficult one to implement because for a rider going anywhere, as much as the place, it's also the ride that's important. Uh, if I didn't know how to ride, of course, I'll sit pillion and I would experience a part of what the rider experiences. See, a pillion can never experience the entirety of what the rider experiences. I mean, if I put you pillion and I take you around Delhi, that would be one experience for you. But the moment we switch and you ride, that experience goes up two notches or maybe yeah. three or four. And it'll be very That's the only agreement I yeah. will sit behind. So uh, <laughs> it would be very difficult to get a rider to let go of that two to three notches and agree to you know, be happy with six. It's, it's very difficult, but uh, interesting thought there. And uh, I will probably ask someone in the audience at some point in time what they think of it. Uh, maybe, ah, Fayaz. Yes, we will take your question. But before that, I want to go to Niels and I want to ask him that um, you started off by saying that, you know, uh, your career in mountain biking started with going down as fast as possible. Speed was your thing. Have you slowed down? Uh, in, in mountain biking, I still like to go fast. I'm going to go to Ladakh with my mountain bike, but just for a week and then go for a two-week road trip on a motorcycle, which has been my dream since, I think, since I saw the first pictures. And being here now, meeting all these amazing artists, musicians, the food, I just can't wait to go there and hope I get used to the not existing air up there as a beach men, boy, whatever. Anyway, um, speed. Um, as an athlete, I think like everything, we learn to walk, we learn to speak, we learn to ride. So um, of course, I, as a kid, I always took it the fast way on the go-kart. But you know, the older you get, the faster you get. At a certain stage, you get slower because you get too old. But I learned how to manage the speed. I learned step by step how to jump, how to you know control my bike? Same thing with motorcycle riding. I I did ride a motorcycle when I was six till I had my first crash was was 17 and I had no license. I my dad was really upset and the police did not like. Are you I have Indian? no license? Huh? Are you Indian? No. I German. know a lot of Indians who ride without a license. <laughs> but I lived in the village. Everybody was doing it. So anyway, um, my dad said you can ride motorcycles, but you get a license. So I learned. A lot by going to the motorcycle driving school. 
or riding school. Um, me riding on a motorcycle, I never really had the speed to go fast on the road. Um, I, in the beginning, I was riding small motorcycles, 125cc, because in Germany you can ride it without... A, if you have a car license, you can ride a 125cc. So a lot of people gave me a lot of uh, smile faces. Uh, you have a small engine, and I always said, the size of the adventure has nothing to do with the size of the engine. And I still believe, I don't care how big my engine is. Because at the end of the day, I said, the slower I go, the more I see. And uh, even if I have a big bike, I ride a Royal Enfield Himalayan, and uh, I can go fast if I, if I want, but I do want to see stuff, and I want to meet people. And I think behind a car, that's why I don't really like driving cars, you don't really feel, you don't smell, you, don't, you cannot look around because you all have bars here and a roof here. And so I, I, I'm not a fast motorcycle rider, when it comes up to race tracks, yeah, it's hard to hold me back because I know I can still get hurt. But if we do know what you do, um, I think it's in many interviews when they ask me about, oh, you always risk your life and why you do this and why you do that and you broke many, many bones in your life. Yes, I did. Every time I broke my bones, 38 in total, was when I was not concentrated, when I put myself under pressure and pressure can be very easily, if you want to impress somebody, this is a men's problem I think we all have. Um, if you want to impress a woman, if you want to impress your friends, whatever. Um, so I learned very quick not to put yourself under pressure. Um, and if somebody wants to go fast, I say, go ahead. We meet up on the next intersection. So I, I, I don't go fast only if I have a racetrack and Especially, I love off-road race tracks. So, but then, still, then I do know my limits, and maybe it has to do with my age. Um, I just go a little bit over the corner, not full throttle like I used to be, because I want to finish the trip to the Himalayans, and I want to continue with the next trip that I'm planning. So, I think it has to do with education, getting older. <laughs> having the right people with you on the road trip. If you have, I had experience with people, Anthony Partridge, if this is online, greetings, he is a maniac on a motorcycle. But I had, we're best friends, but it's very hard to ride with him because he passes you from the right side. And uh, you know, you ride and all of a sudden it's like, whoa, Anthony. So I, I choose people I ride with. Um, and I would not ride with anyone. I have to see how they write. Coming back to the question, I don't like to sit in the back, but I also don't like to have somebody on the back because we never really learned to have two people on a motorcycle. And the car is no problem. You can pack all your kids, all your friends in the car, but on a motorcycle, as soon as you put luggage on your bike, as soon as you fill up the whole gas tank, as soon as you have bags, friends, the motorcycle is not the same like before. So um, I had a situation where I have people, and I told them, when I lean to the left, you have to lean to the right, uh, left. Yes, 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 I do that. So you lean to the left, and all of a sudden he goes to the right, and the bike's like, oh. So yeah, I don't do it, and also I have responsibility for four kids. That's enough responsibility for my shoulders. So. Um, I don't want to be responsible for somebody else's life, to be honest, um, because I don't, I cannot take that, that weight on my shoulder, to be honest. It's, it's so difficult to ride through the city because they, you have to look everywhere, and it's not you that make mistakes, there are millions of other people, especially in India, there's so many cars um, and motorcycles and dogs on the street. <laughs> And uh, that I don't want to take this opportunity. So, um, and I think we have to learn it. We need people like you two that show people what it changes to the bike and what you have to be aware of. And yeah, I think we, we, have to, we should learn it at the driving school. Super. Uh, what I found very interesting, a point which we normally wouldn't raise 
is uh, this need to, you know, we, we motorcyclists, we are very competitive. If he rides, I normally want to ride faster. If he corners, if he gets his knees down, I want to get my head down, <laughs> and then somebody else will come and pick me up, but that's, that's fine. Uh, I, I do know that it's a bit of a gender thing, so I wanted to ask Ritika, as a woman rider, and Huda as well, as a woman rider, do you feel a similar need for being competitive? Do you? Ah, yes. <laughs> Interesting story alert. I, I just want to say, Huda, thank you for not killing me. <laughs> Huda will ask you about that story later, and then we'll get your perspective on that. I'm, I'm sure that's going to be a very, very interesting story, but Ritika. Being competitive, I really don't know what to say. But yeah, I face a lot of similar situations like this, like what he said. So, very, very specific questions now. Do you, when you're in the saddle, feel the need to go faster than the guys you're riding with? <laughs> no, no, absolutely. Have you ever noticed if the guys around you are trying to outdo you? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Many times. See, oh, all on. the time. <laughs> absolutely. How do you deal with them? <laughs> of course I do. No, you don't want to. Of course I do. Women motorcyclists just have another You don't have a microphone. Word. It's her turn. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but uh, I would definitely agree to this. Whenever I am on the road, I have seen a lot of guys. Some are comfortable seeing a woman riding. Some are really not comfortable. And because I stay in Mumbai, you have rickshawala all over the place. So they definitely don't like women going ahead of them. So there is definitely a lot of clashes because of that. Secondly, um, is the society, because they are built up in such a way because some men, I would be very specific, some I'm not talking about everyone, they would never like a woman going ahead of them. And that's a fact, so let's face it. And uh, I can't help, I can't do much, because that's what I say when I do women motorcycle coaching. The first thing I tell people those have just learned from me, like there will be thousands of people on the road just keep honking behind you, ignore them. That's the only thing you can do at this moment because you're just learning and getting there. There will be a day when he will just move across and he will be worried about it. So there is, everybody has a time of their own. But yes, there are a lot of people. Still, I would say biking community is huge, but not everybody is happy to see women bikers all across. They still have a lot of competitions going across within themselves. Because if a woman does better, a man definitely wants to do a better than her. So that's how it has come across to me as well. So, Huda, obviously, when something like that happens, uh, you as a rider, you're in danger. The person who's trying to outdo you is also in danger, probably doesn't know it because he's, as we all agree, is an idiot. Um, how do you deal with it? Um. <coughs> I like it. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, that's, I'm just relieved that Anand didn't tell that story. Um, now, now no, no, yeah, no, he will. He can try. Um, so my experience has been, um, I've, I've ridden a lot in the city. Uh, I've only been seriously traveling on the motorcycle for the last maybe um, four or five years. Um, otherwise, it's always been in the city and I've done most of my learning in the city. Um, my experience has not been good. My experience has been, uh, while I resent the fact that I have to be more careful, um, and I, uh, I wear all the gear all the time, so it's, um, I'm not very, very noticeable on a motorcycle. I, it, I look like a small boy on a motorcycle for the most part. But when I am recognized as a female rider, um, I would say about 70% of my experiences have been that people come up really close to me, I've been groped, I've been pushed over, I know Candida has been pushed over, uh, another female motorcyclist who has been traveling around the world solo on uh, her motorcycle. Um, and they just want to race. I am lucky though that I have had the privilege of learning from very good teachers, like really good teachers. And we all know what the infrastructure, like you said in India, the roads are very smooth and you know, my sarcasm meter was broken at that point. But, with regards to infrastructure over here, you don't know when the next pothole is coming. You don't know when the next homemade speed bump is coming. But with the advantage of learning from really good teachers, I've either been able to outmaneuver the people who are coming too close or, or are racing, or 
in some cases, you just stop. You just stop, you let your ego go, and you understand that you are a minority over here, and you prioritize your own safety. That's it. And again, things are changing. A lot of people are becoming a lot more respectful. A lot of people are, you know, thumbs up. Uh, one of my favorite things is to raise my visor when there's little girls behind their dads going to school and, you know, suddenly the world opens up for them. But for the most part, I think one of the things that does need to be um, acknowledged is that uh, um, it's, it's hard. It's hard to be um, targeted just because of your gender. And uh, I hope that I see a much bigger change in my lifetime. But I don't feel the need to go fast. I do feel the need to be safe, but being safe sometimes means that you go faster than the other person, you outmaneuver the other person, and you find your way to safety. Safety is priority for us right now. Beno, from your own experience in other countries, do you see similar sort of um, gender interactions happening in the motorcycle world? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually surprised that, uh, who was it what you said that, that they are honking at you, right? They're honking all the time here at everybody. I know. I mean, that, that cannot be gender specific. <laughs> cannot be gender, they're honking? I mean, I lived the last five years of my life in Bangkok, Thailand, where you have very disciplined driving. They never honk. And then coming here six weeks ago to my new home, which is a wonderful place, lovely people, great food, fantastic. But the honking? It's like a sport. It's, it's like a music. <laughs> it's orchestral. Nabiha and me, we've been riding in an auto. Seriously, we've been riding in an auto at night. There was no car in front, nothing right, nothing left, nothing behind us. We were the only ones. And the guy was honking like crazy the whole time. So, uh, seriously. And uh, I, I wonder what all the honking is about. So, and, One day you and, find out. And I would, I would suggest, with, with all honesty, as, as a newcomer and with all my respect, I would suggest to do something about that. Um, but, coming back to the question, um, I think in, in general there are less women bikers than men, so it's, it's probably um, um, by far a more masculine thing to do than a feminine thing. Uh, in where I'm coming from originally, and I, I'm a German citizen, I left Germany when I was 26 years old, there the statistics are that women are better drivers than men, more responsible drivers, causing less accidents but also uh, uh, significantly less women on bikes. Those of my female friends who are bikers are fantastic riders. They are, and, and there, I don't think that that is there the case so much like both of you described it, not so much in Europe. When I was living in the Arab region, it was, uh, uh, I've been just so disrespected by young people. And uh, I was riding at the time, can I mention brand names here or not? I was uh, riding at the time it's a, an Suzuki, open forum. A, a Suzuki DR600, <coughs> which is a single-cylinder enduro bike, up and down the dunes, fantastic bike. But of course, 90% uh, you're riding on tarmac roads. And when then some 16-year-old boy comes riding with a, with a Chevrolet Caprice Classic behind me and gets that close, and I'm already driving 120, and I can't accelerate away anymore, that was for me the reason to exchange it against a Ducati 900 SS. And then I just shifted <laughs> down, shifted down from the sixth into the third gear, and I was a kilometer in front of him. So that was road rage male, male, uh, young. And in, when I was uh, in Bangkok the last five years, I don't think that there was what, what both of you described, I think it might be more specific, unfortunately, for here. Yeah. Um, on sustainability, to come back to that point that we discussed, um, let's also be honest that an SUV burns about 20 liters of petrol on a 100 kilometer, whereas a bike burns about three, four, a small bike a little bit less, a big bike a little bit more. 
Uh, of course, you have to divide that by the number of people that can be transported. But bikes are a little bit more fuel sensitive than cars. Having said that, in the global bike industry, of course, there are already bikes available since many years with electric um, uh, engines. And they have uh, fantastic acceleration power, better than uh, fuel-driven cars, uh, bikes, and uh, even better. And it's, it's getting there. And uh, of course, Heritage, Royal Enfield, don't make the mistake what Harley Davidson did in the past, just to keep the heritage and not develop themselves as well. Because that, that's why, for me, those bikes became then very <coughs> non-attractive. But uh, yeah, and uh, who knows, maybe in the future, we will also be able to ride the same engines that we have now with hydrogen. And that would be, that would be a wonderful thing. So I think that all uh, car and bike manufacturers have a responsibility to get us into the next stage of more environmental, environmentally friendly um, means of transport. I don't know if that will be electric transport or whether it will be hydrogen or maybe something else. I don't know. But, um, yeah, I wanted to share those points on sustainability and all the points of, I'm, I'm so happy that you all mentioned that. Very, very important. So what we bring there, we should take it back. Of course, our emissions and also the abrasion of our tires, very difficult. But other than that, we should have um, environmentally friendly tourism and culturally sensitive tourism. And we should be responsible bikers. Also, sorry to hear that the bikers are not that responsible yet, but let's influence them. Let's show them what responsible bikers uh, are and, and uh, maybe inspire them to also become responsible bikers. Yes, I think uh, that is exactly the intent of the partnership and of what we are trying to talk about here. Uh, very important point going out there on respect, not just for the self, but also for others, male, female, male to female, male to male, between age gaps. Um, it's very, very important for us as road users, and I'm not singling out motorcyclists here, I'm singling out road users, to be respectful of other road users. It's very, very important. Our lives depend on it. Hers does, hers does, theirs do, mine does. When people don't respect us when we are on two wheels, we are in danger of not returning home. And that's a, that goes out a little bit more than just wearing a helmet or, uh, irrespective of all the gear that I might be wearing, it's still possible to can entirely kill me if you so desire, if I'm, when I'm on a motorcycle. So we're a little bit more fragile than the people inside cars with their airbags and ABS and whatnot. Um, so please be mindful of that fact when you see us on the road. Don't get within six inches of our knees and try and get a picture of our motorcycle. If you want, we'll stop on the road, take pictures, carry on. Uh, do not come and race with us because we are in no race with you. Uh, do not come and touch us, please. We are not objects of uh, to be watched and touched and poked and prodded. We are not that. We are also human beings who are traveling. So respect is a very important uh, underlying issue at every level, including when we travel to your homes. Uh, it's uh, very important to respect communities. It's something I learned very recently also, uh, apart from the fact that, you know, back in the school days when corporal punishment was a method of education, it used to be taught through us, through various parts of our body that, you know, it's important to respect people. But um, recently I was uh, traveling through Arunachal and uh, it's unbelievable the kind of hospitality that I experienced. It's not the kind of hospitality that you would get in a hotel because it, is, it wasn't five-star accommodation. I was living with a farmer and uh, all he could offer us, I, I see at least one person here who was with me on that trip, um, who's smiling, the gentleman in the green cap. Uh, he was with me in, on that trip and uh, we were staying in this village, and uh, we were housed with uh, a farmer who offered us food, who let us sleep in his room. Uh, mind you, the room we were sleeping in was just one hall with a fire hearth in the middle. Uh, the hut doesn't have any rooms. They have no concept of rooms there. Uh, they are still that pure. Now, when I go there, I have to respect the fact that that's his lifestyle. I can't bring my lifestyle into that space and then start demanding. That's, that's one of the things that, that's very, very important for us 
as a motorcycle tourers to think about. And uh, that, is, that is something I would like to talk about next before moving on to the next part and probably the last part of the, uh, this panel. Uh, Anand, I want to start with you. You take people to all kinds of cultures, not just India. I mean, India in itself is a subcontinent and it's, it's entirely like a continent in itself. But when you take people to other parts of the country, other parts of the world especially, we, we see this dualism in Indian tourists, you know. We are very negligent and callous when we are here. We leave immigration and we become model citizens. And so how, how do you deal with that? So I think that's an advantage that works towards us, right? But it's also an image that I've, or rather, I tell myself and I tell the group that we represent India. So if you go as a motorcyclist, they have not seen motorcyclists. If you go to, for example, we went to South Africa, Cambodia, whatever, Europe, most of the impressions of India are not so good right? because they see what uh, you mentioned, which is <clears throat> usually they've come on tour groups and you know, there's, there's a lot of things that they don't like about it. But as a motorcyclist, one of the things that, I, that we want to change or that we are saying that at that point is that we represent India in one sense and we're here to sort of absorb who they are, I mean, what the culture is and how do I sort of tell them that um, what we want to seek is to take away while also leaving the right impressions with them. And that's a difficult, uh, it's, it's as much as it's difficult, but I think the attitude does change. And I can only tell you very specifically with the tours that we ran in the Adriatic, it was impossible or nearly impossible to get somebody there to give us motorcycles. Until I went, met with them, did a recce, and then they said, oh, yeah, I think you can ride. Right. So it's, uh, it's, it's evolving, right? I mean, as, as all of us said, I mean, a lot of things, I mean, even including about women riding, a lot of things are changing, but slowly. And I like to say that I represent India from that standpoint to say, am I, am I respectful towards them? Am I respectful towards their culture? I'm borrowing a bike from somebody. Let me not trash it. That's the other thing that I find with Indians is, or I think maybe a lot of people is, the moment you rent a motorcycle, I'm just going to trash the hell out of it and return it. And these are all our own poor attitudes of having maybe grown up here or, I mean, I'm not trying to justify something, but it's something that we have to take away from saying, can I change that with this group of 15, 20 people that we're going to, to see another country? When we park, I, attitude, for example, is to not park in one line. All of these things are, uh, I don't know, either you have to, talk, you have to be taught or you have to be put in line to say, just you have to move it out of the way because it's a safety issue. It's not just for looks or a photograph, but it is a safety issue because there are cars trundling down and they're going at a certain speed. And our attitude is, it's okay, I'll just park it anyway. I'm sure you've seen that. So, you, you know, using the horn, things like that. I said, these are some certain etiquettes that we'll follow because we're here. Uh, getting people to understand riding on the right side of the road versus the left side of the road. That's, of course, it's, a, it's, a, it's something that the brain clicks at some point and say, oh, let me start riding, you know, riding on the right. But this, uh, <clears throat> it's a lot of it is education. And I think, how do you bring that education to each and every person? Because you're gonna, always going to have that one person who says, ah, I don't believe in it. Right? That's, a, that's, the, that's the difficulty that I always find. And then it just takes some time and then he understands that, okay, I'm here, let me respect this. So that's kind of what we've been trying to do with all of the tours. You have something to say. Yeah, well, um, I think uh, we should not just talk about bad stuff because I've seen, even in a short time between 2019 when I came here for the no, first time was 2018, 2019, the first road trip we did from Mumbai to, to Goa um, for Hamilton for India. Um, it's only three years, but I've seen changes. Um, one, he's really one of my best friends, KD, he did a helmet this year for Helmets for India. He also did a helmet for the first exhibition, but in cooperation with a group of artists. Um, I remember we rode through the mountains before we went down to Goa, to Bagotor Beach, and we had a break. It was, it was, we came here in April, which was a big mistake, it was way too hot. So we had to drink a lot. And uh, of course, we had these little plastic bottles. But what we did is we sucked out the air, squeezed them down, put the cap back on, so it's a really small and packed. Put in our backpacks, and then went to the hotel. Yeah, still left footprints, of course, yes. But we, because I grew up 
in Germany, your trash, put it in your pocket, and when you see a trash can, you put it. it. It was normal for me. Same thing like wearing a helmet. But KD, I don't talk bad about you, KD. Uh, love you to death. But for him, uh, he just emptied and threw it in the forest. And I looked at him and I was like, KD, what, what, what are you doing? Why? I said, why you put the plastic bottle there? He said, well, where, where should I put it? We had a big conversation in a nice way, and uh, he went through the forest, <laughs> he picked it up. I felt very, very bad, because for him, he grew up doing that. Two weeks ago, I saw a post of him. He started an organization, not organization, but him and his friends, once a week, they walk down the beach and clean up the beach. And it has been like his biggest passion now um, to pick up trash. And what he does today is he makes art out of the trash. So 2019, he was a little punk, throwing the trash in the forest. But I felt sorry for him um, because he, he never learned that it's... For him, it was normal. So I do see changes and also concerning... Um, we call it educating people or showing people. I think the best thing is to travel with, with your locals in other countries and feel it on your own, what it means to be in a different country. Um, but also you guys have to learn. For, um, every time I come here, I want, I want Indian food. I want to stay with the locals. If I don't want, if I don't want that, I can stay at home, you know? Most of my friends, um, or good buddies I met here, they always say, no, 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 it's, don't stay in this guest house. Uh, we find a nice hotel for you. I said, I don't want to stay in the nice hotel. And the best experience I had was when I was here in March, April for one month, traveling through India. Um, I got invited. I, we went on accident. There was a holy, and after the holy was one week of celebrating the village, and everybody who used to live in the village comes back one night, they cook all together, and the next day, every single person gets food for free, and everybody celebrates together. So me, as a naive tourist, I walked into the village, I had no idea what's going on, and all of a sudden, a guy grabs me by the hand and said, oh, did you eat? And I said, no, no, I eat later. No, no, come, 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 come. If somebody wants to see the pictures, I would love to show it to you, because I was sitting in a there was no light, there was a fireplace, I was sitting on, on rice backs, and that was the best dinner I had in my life. The best dinner. And the night ended up sleeping in his house. It just had a roof, and then he had curtains to build rooms, and this guy was basically sleeping right next to me, and the next morning I was sitting, it was a dirty ground, it was in the kitchen with a fireplace, and I had the best breakfast of my life. So you have to understand, we, we want to explore India, or I want to explore India. I don't want to sleep in a nice hotel. Yes, I like to have a nice hot shower, but when I'm here, I want to explore your life. When you come to my place, I make sure you explore my, my Germany, not the beer garden, but you will explore the way I live, and I will never force you to do something that you know, has nothing to do with my country. When you come to my place, we eat German food. I will not take you to a pizzeria. Um, so you have, we have to understand that, you know, like when we explore different worlds, we have to be open to explore your world. And also, when you come to my place, be open to explore Germany, the way I see Germany. Um, so I think it's on, on both sides respect, you know, that we, it's not just respecting you, <laughs> you have to respect me and it's like, Everything is about um, being open for something new, even if it's strange for a moment. But that's, I think that's the only way we can really explore new countries. And then I think re having respect and what you leave and what you take, because at the end of the day, we leave a lot, hopefully not just trash, but we do take a lot. And I will take this back home to my place. And when I have a dinner with my friends, I will talk about what I experienced in, in India. And all I experienced in India was more than fantastic. So it's, 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 you know, it's for both sides a win-win situation. If you get treated back, yeah, a bad, you take bad memories home. But, you know, it's all, we have to work together while we travel. So I, I hear a bit about storytelling here. I mean, 
a lot of what we have heard is just anecdotes and stories. And I, I want to bring Ritika's experience here right now because uh, she's also an expert on social media, etc. So how do you bring out these stories and tell them to people so that our lives are more enriched and theirs are as well? How, how do you bridge that gap? Because obviously I can't take everyone on my trip, but I can bring stories of my trip, my experiences to them. So how, how do you do that? Okay, so me and Hoda in the morning, we had a very interesting conversation with Miss Varti and we just asked her what mm. she's looking forward like when there are a group of riders, those who come in. The first thing that she said to us, please don't come in groups. Like we would appreciate if there are very yeah, big groups. Come very limited because that's a good thing. Second is uh, that she also mentioned that uh, when the riders go across such areas where there are no hotels, uh, all that's available are homestays. Respect their houses. It's their houses, so please respect it. So every time you go there, doesn't matter what motorcycle you ride, but you are entering their house. And she also mentioned that there is a lot of power gradient because you are coming on your motorcycle and you're going to somebody's house which is very local. So when you go there, the attitude that you carry towards them is like, because I have money, I can just go ahead and buy everything. But reality is not like that. You're going and staying in somebody else's house. So you need to respect. And when I go back from such places, definitely even I got a chance of staying in homestays as well. When I go back, I just want to say that the way you respect yourself, the way you respect your own houses, please respect to their houses as well. Like when you travel all around, not every time you will get an opportunity uh, to go ahead and say something, but your attitude, your actions, and the way you treat them is definitely how does it gonna matter to them. And even uh, if you could say uh, through social media also, mm -hmm. like uh, things that you can post or you know the stories or something, please be kind enough to show the right thing that you've been doing. Like it's very easy to fake a lot of things, but being kind and showing the truth that you're doing, it's difficult in nowadays. So yes, that I would say. Thank you. Benno, uh, I know you are looking forward to riding around some. Uh, I'm hoping to join you on some of those as well. Uh, how do you plan to collect experiences from your rides in India? And how do you plan to take them to your own circle of friends, families, etc.? Well, f first of all, I'm, I'm going to buy a nice Royal Enfield, uh, the 650 Interceptor. That's the one that I selected. <laughs> I will put uh, a nice backrest so that my wife feels comfortable and uh, maybe a little rack and panniers and the tank rucksack so that we can take things with us. And hopefully with uh, some of you guys, we will make some of the first experiences together and uh, yeah, explore various different parts uh, of India, starting with, uh, with the north. And then weekend after weekend, or take a little longer weekend, maybe starting on a Friday, coming back on a Monday or Tuesday. Ah, Experience. <laughs> <laughs> well, you see, our, we have three kids together, and they are all at university now. So we don't have to, we're not dependent on school <laughs> vacations anymore for the first time this year. That's a big one. And, uh, <laughs> So we really want to, to do what we've done when we were living in Thailand a little bit. We did several nice motorcycle tours over there. We want to do this here. Yeah, and then um, take the experience, meet friends, not necessarily traveling alone, traveling in a group of two to three bikes. That's my preferred um, way of traveling. Even though if you travel alone, normally you get to know people on the, in the villages better than if you uh, travel with, with other bikes. So yeah, that's, uh, I hope that answers your question a little, a little bit. It, it does, it does, hmm? uh, it does. Thank you, Benno. Uh, you have something else to say as well. I have something else to say. I think with, uh, with, uh, with the UNESCO and, and Royal Enfield trip, I think that we should also document our experiences. I would suggest that those villages that we meet, for sure they have some signature meals to cook. Why not publishing a cookbook of these, of these villages? Why not uh, de developing a, a roadmap 
like, like for the for the uh, like a waterproof roadmap that you can put in the tank rack sack, or an app for the to to develop something like this. But also, I would very much hope that jointly between Royal Enfield and UNESCO that we will uh, be able to develop an illustrated first class book of these uh, experiences that we will do so that we can also share that with people who are not so fortunate that they can experience the ride by themselves. Certainly, I, well, we certainly hope to accomplish that. Uh, part of the reason why we are in this partnership is to document and present over a period of time uh, the intangible cultural heritage, including food. There is a food panel tonight as well. Some of you might be able to experience that. <clears throat> uh, the idea is to present this whole humongous repository of heritage to the common person. However, there's a danger of doing that. And that, that's something, as a journalist, I'm very conscious of. Uh, when you open up a place, and I'm sorry, Huda, I'm going to stick to the tradition of uh, throwing googlies at you. Um, when you open up a place, when you let people know about a place, you also open doors of unbridled entry into those places. We are very, very conscious of that. It's happened to Ladakh. It's going to happen to the Northeast. It's inevitable. But can we do something to offset it? How do we open up doors and tell people not to rush in, but go in one at a time? How do we do that? I'm. <laughs> well, um, Mount Everest is actually a good example because you know they've they've raised the barrier to people coming over there by just raising the price. Not everybody can afford it. Um, I think that's extreme, but. Uh, I'm going to actually reference my conversation with Malika Virdi. Malika is way at the back over there. And she actually rode across um, in the mountains back in the 1980s. Um, she was very specific about having a motorcycle that she had to kickstart, unlike today, where we just get on one and press a button. Um, and now she's the sarpanch of a village, and um, they have 40. 40 homestays? 20. 20. 20 homestays over there. So, Anandu, what she's done is that she has empowered the people who run the homestays by telling them <clears throat> that they have the backing of the whole village. If there is somebody who comes in, if there is somebody who behaves in a manner that is not um, desirable to them. If there are too many people that they cannot manage, they have the backing of the whole village and the luxury of saying, no, you're not my client, you're my guest. Behave or leave. And why, while, you know, they do rely on, one of the things that she said was very, very pertinent. She said that tourism cannot be uh, the mainstay of an economy. It needs to be the subset of an economy, and I completely agree yeah. over there. So when you have people coming together in, in, in sensitive places, I mean, it's inevitable. Motorcycles eventually lead to cars, eventually lead to buses, eventually lead to enormous tour groups. I mean, that's the way things go. But when you, in these sensitive places, when people come together and one, they have fostered pride in their community and their space, and two, they are in agreement that this is how much we can take, this is how much we can afford, this is how much firewood we can give, these are the resources that we can give. When you come together in agreement, then that, I think, is a much more sustainable barrier to put in place with regards to the number of people, with regards to the number of resources, and with regards to the quality of the experience. So thank you, Malika. I mean, it's, it was an incredible conversation that I had the privilege of listening to. Thank you, Huda. Uh, you seem to have done remarkably well with responses to my googly questions. Uh, so, but unfortunately, I've run out of my stock of those. So I will have to bring this session to a close. But my own personal takeaways from this session as a motorcyclist, individual, journalists, etc., is that 
is about the power of choice. I mean, we are always choosing whether we are doing something that is right or whether we are doing something that is simply convenient. I think sometimes convenient is right, but right isn't always convenient. And sometimes we've got to make that inconvenient choice of going with what is right instead of what is convenient. Um, I'd like to leave you all with this small little anecdote of, again, my trip to Arunachal. We had gone to a village which had never seen anybody from the rest of India before us. And we were about a group of 35, 40 people in all. We spent two hours there. They served us wonderful breakfast. Um, lovely people, fantastic hospitality. We spent the two hours and one hour, 50 minutes later when we were leaving, some of us realized that their first contact, the first footprint that we were leaving behind was a mountain of trash. Uh, people had just eaten, dropped the plates, dropped the paper plates, the leaf plates, everything just there. So some of us got together, cleaned it all up, put it in trash bags and carried it back home. We did still leave a footprint, but uh, hopefully not a very large and a very toxic one, but it is the power to say no. Uh, no, we will not violate another road user's right to be on that road space. No, we will not violate Fayaz's home when I'm traveling there because it's his home, I'm going to leave. Uh, no, we will not um, use up as much gas as we can, riding as fast as we can, where we shouldn't be doing that. Uh, no, we will not ride without a helmet because uh, our kids need to be safe, we need to be safe for our kids. Uh, no, we will not endanger the lives of the women she trains because their livelihoods depend on it. Uh, no, we will not travel in groups which are larger than five and six and seven because it's just too much for the terrain. No, I shall not throw any more googlies at you. And with that, I would like to conclude this session. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you so much. Please do not go away, however, because there's wonderful sessions on films. Uh, there's a lovely panel on food from the region. Uh, we have worked very, very hard, actually not me, the people who deserve credit are somewhere here, uh, who have worked very, very hard to bring you, a, let's say a sneak peek of the Himalayas and across west to east, right here in Delhi for you guys to experience. So please do not leave us. This session has come to an end, but the party carries on.